So as you mentioned, I'm Dave Borshinsky. I've been uh, working in the uh, user experience arena for about 17 years now. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting how our ghosts can come back and haunt us. I was uh, <clears throat> just hanging around the, the sessions yesterday and all of a sudden uh, I recognized a, a face from Philadelphia, which I was like, wait a minute, what? Um, so when I first started in user experience with, uh, was with a project management company called Primavera Systems. And there's Kurt, right there. <laughs> so do you go by Kurt now or Curtis? Kurt, Kurt. Uh, he can tell you how and when I started and he's probably, you know, <clears throat> he, can, he can pull out all the, the scary stories for you uh, if anybody wants to hear those. Um, I have, uh, I am currently working as the manager of product usability and design uh, at Burton Group. They're an analyst firm, much like Gartner and Forrester. Uh, I'm also the founder of Usable Patterns. Uh, we're just a consulting group that really tries to help you know, local companies work on Win32 applications, web-based applications, anything we can do to, to help people get product to market, capture requirements. Um, we, we try and do just about a little bit of everything. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, as a user experience person, uh, I, I think that oftentimes people wonder, well, why, how can user experience fit in Agile? Why, why include user experience in Agile? Um, and a lot of the times, you know, we get lumped in that big upfront design uh, portion of development. And I'm here to tell you that that's really not where uh, user experience belongs. Um, just, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody here is very familiar with the manifesto. Uh, two of the items in there are very near and dear to my heart in that we value individuals' interactions over processes and tools, and we <coughs> prefer customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Um, I think that those two things that, if you talk to anybody that, that is really a user advocate, which is really how I feel when I, wherever I'm working, um, those will always be very close to their, to their heart. So why are we here? I can't speak for everyone, obviously. Um, the reason that I'm here today is because I want to make sure the software that I'm helping deliver is making an impact for my clients and, and, and their users. Um, you know, I sometimes work in a weird situation where the, my clients are not the end user of the product I'm developing, and so I have to kind of balance a couple different levels of requirements. But ultimately, uh, I want to make sure that the people using the software are using it and feeling good about it and getting what they want done. I want them to have a positive experience um, and to use the, the software to accomplish those goals. I want them to buy more software and services because the more software and services they buy, the more money I'm going to end up making in the long run. Um, and it, you know, I'm not all about making money, but I do believe that the Agile Manifesto can help me do all of these things because ultimately, I want to have a life away from developing software. Um, and as we think about that, I think all of us would realize that you know, that's, that's what we work for. So how many of you have ever heard the term persona? Okay, quite a few of you. How many of you have ever worked for a company that has tried using Persona? Okay, not quite as many. How many of you that worked for those companies thought the Personas that came up uh, for discussion were kind of ridiculous? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, you didn't help develop those, right, Alan? The, 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 they're ones you probably came on and he was like, oh no, we gotta do something about this. Yeah. Uh, how many of you believe that Persona do smack of upfront design? Okay, a couple of you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to give some answers to these questions. I don't know that I'm going to necessarily convert you to uh, my way of thinking, but hopefully I can give you a tool that you'll be able to take back and help you interact with your customers in a, in a better way. So, what is a Persona? Um, Personas are a customer profile that puts a face on what is known about your client. It really is a way to kind of encapsulate the data. Uh, and unfortunately, when we're talking about data, that's a little bit difficult to portray the data just as data. Um, spreadsheets don't tell a user story. That's why your story cards are not all done Excel, in Excel most of the time. It's an archetype created to represent a particular class of real users. Um, not people that you would like to sell the software to, but people that you are selling the software to. 
Um, there are times when you will want to look at the type of people that you would like to sell the software to, but right now we're going to concentrate just on the people that we are selling to. <clears throat> it resembles several people who were interviewed, but never matches one of them exactly. And most importantly, it's important to remember that this is just a tool. Uh, I was having this discussion with Alan Cooper yesterday. It is just a tool. It is used to help us understand what the customer motivation is for what they're trying to do. It is a, a tool to help us keep the client user goal in mind while developing your product. So just really quick, who wants to volunteer what one of their customer goals are? So let's, let's see if we can identify one of those real quick. Anybody want to volunteer? Right there. So uh, we have three personas in our company, and one of them is an individual contributor, and his goal is give, my, give me my work and get out of my way. And so the concept is don't make the application be so hard to use or make me work with it so much that I'm actually wasting time trying to get this stuff to work while trying to do everything else. Right. Give me my work and get out of my way. That's an excellent example of a goal. I was more, more domain specific, but you know, for an accounting system, I want to be able to reconcile my quarterly you know, revenue against uh, you know, stand, and, and quarter revenue with, with that individual daily revenue. Okay, why? Because that's my job. <laughs> okay. So otherwise, and otherwise um, my clients are uh, going to fire me. Right. Okay. And that's an excellent goal, right? I want to be able to, to maintain the accounting data correctly so that I don't get fired and so that my customers buy more software. Is that? Yeah, so those are the customers Right, right, right. right. Um, how many of you have an iPhone here? I, I know there's a couple. Okay. Uh, who wants to volunteer why they bought the iPhone? Go ahead. So I can sync my calendar. So I can sync my calendar. Why, why do you want to sync your calendar? Uh, so that I show up at things on time, basically. So that you show up at things on time. Why do you want to show up at things on time? Okay, it's embarrassing. So do you understand how I'm trying to push it a little bit further? It's not just I want to use the software to accomplish this. It's really I have an underlying goal that I want to be able to get to, okay? Um, <clears throat> so it isn't their goal to use my software to do X. It is my goal, <clears throat> even if a product is the coolest device ever, right? Because I'm. I'm picking up the Palm Pre today after the conference, and everybody's going to get one of those now. Just drop your iPhones, right? Right? Am I hearing crickets? Um, <clears throat> so, productivity software. Clients want to get their work done and go home, right? They don't care that they can make beautiful fonts. I mean, yeah, they will because it, there's a part of the user experience that says, I want to have joy while I'm doing my job. But mostly, I just want to get my job done and go home. Gaming systems. Uh, I want to be able to sit down in front of a couch and turn into a vegetable for a couple of hours and not have to worry about the rest of the world. I want to be entertained. I want to have fun. Smartphones. Clients are looking to work away from the office. You know, they, they have some desire that they want to not be tied down to that desk, you know, eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or, you know, heaven forbid, 15 hours a day. Um, they want to be able to entertain themselves. They want to be able to look fashionable. I'm, I'm sure that nobody in this room bought the iPhone because they wanted to look fashionable. But, you know, I do know some people. Okay, we do have one person. And I notice you also have a MacBook. Oh, and Jeff, Jeff, please hold up your MacBook. Uh, Jeff also buys the skins for his MacBook so he can be extremely fashionable. Um, but the goal is not to use your software, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is, is you can get multiple pieces of software to do the same thing. The Palm Pre will do many of the things the iPhone will do. The Blackberry will do many of the things the iPhone will do. But ultimately, it's so that the user can enjoy doing what they're doing and get it done and not have to worry about it. <clears throat> so, how do we make a real persona? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to talk to people. And so this is where I tie it back to the, the, the manifesto, right? We value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It really ultimately may not matter to your end user what platform you write the software in. It may because if you write it for the Mac platform, you're writing for a smaller audience. On the other hand, you may be writing it uh, 
for a more well-informed audience or, or an audience that is expecting a different level of interaction. But ultimately, it's about the individual being able to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And customer collaboration, that means you actually have to talk to your customers. You have to sit down with them, you have to walk a mile in their shoes and understand what they're trying to accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis. So, interacting with your clients and users. How many of you feel that you're doing that now? Wow, I really hope that we'd have more hands here um, because that really seems to be one of the things that Agile really is, is important for. Um, the ability to sit down with your customers is one of the most valuable resources you're going to have. And the interactions that you're going to have with them are going to change the way you look at developing that software. <clears throat> visit them where they work. Why would I say that? Why would I say go visit them where they work? Jeff will tell you it's because I got trained by, by Hugh Byer and Karen, uh, Catherine Holzblatt and, and I believe in contextual inquiry, but there's other reasons too. I think it's because in, in, in any other situation, it's a contrived situation. If you're there at their desk just watching them play around, you see the, the flow charts that are on their wall, you see the gizmos that they have everywhere, you see how they stack their work, you see the flow of information as they move papers around. And you're able to just look at what they're really doing and, and you can see patterns. I mean, if, if one person does it once, it's a coincidence, but if you see two or three people doing similar workarounds or shortcuts that they've actually found within your system, then you're starting to see more of a pattern of execution that maybe you're missing on. Right. Over here. Empathy. Empathy. Okay. Empathy. If I'm sitting there in the environment where they're at, and I understand that they're sitting in a pretty harsh environment where it's pretty noisy, maybe they're not having an easy time <clears throat> being able to concentrate on their screen because there's so much noise, because they're in a cube farm now, um, I'm going to have a lot of empathy for them as they're using my product. Okay? I'm also going to catch things that I, I would not have caught. Right? That was the point that you were trying to make. Um, there's a lot of times when I sit down with a customer, I'll, I'll ask them, so what do you do all day? Well, they'll hit the high points, right? They'll hit the high points and they'll say, well, you know, I, I come in, I check my email, and I look to see if there's any hot items in my email that I need to take care of. And then after I go for my email, I, I look uh, at the stack of stuff on my desk that I need to work that I've been pushing off for X amount of days, and then I'll dive into work. In the meantime, <clears throat> one of the companies I used to work for did systems management software. And so that was the story that we got from one of those individuals. And he would sit down, steaming hot cup of coffee, really excited about getting forward, uh, looking forward to the day's work. And before he even got to a second email, he was responding to a call taking him away from his desk and his cup of coffee that he had just gotten that he had hoped to be able to drink while reading his emails. Okay, so that was one time. And then we went to the next company. And the steaming cup of coffee was nearly exactly the same. You know, they come in, I don't know what it is about system engineers or network engineers, they always need to have that cup of coffee in the morning to get them going. I don't know, I'm kind of the same, anyone else kind of like that? Yeah. <clears throat> so you start realizing that there's a pattern, as, as was mentioned. And you start realizing that, wow, they really never have a chance to finish their coffee. They never really have a chance to have a continuous time in front of their screen where they're going to be using our software. And so maybe we better make sure there's no timeouts. And that information never would have been, achieved, or would never have been found by interviews. Um, unless they're telling you, and this is the other problem with doing user analysis just by interviews, well, you know what, your, your software always times out whenever I use it. Or, you know what, I hate your software, all it does is blow up every third time I use it. You know, when you're doing a user interview and they're not right there at their desk, they're going to tell you their pain points. They're not going to tell you all the other things that are working well for them. They're going to tell you your, their pain points and make you focus on those. And that's one of the things that you kind of brought up, right? It's, it's one of those situations where all of a sudden you're focusing on the leg of the elephant as opposed to the trunk. So ultimately what we want you to do is we want you to learn what they do and why they do it. Customer co <coughs> collaboration over contract negotiation. 
Again, identify what they're really trying to accomplish and how they're trying to ac accomplish it. Ask them what seems overly tedious. You know, sit down, have a conversation with them. Buy them that coffee in the morning and sit down and talk to them and then tag along with them as they're walking around trying to put out the fires of the day. <clears throat> Ask them what they already like about the product. You know, a lot of the times when you're talking to customers, they will focus only on the problems that they have. Is there an experience that you really like? Jeff, tell me about the iPhone. What is it you like best about the iPhone? I didn't have anything like it before, so I like best feeling connected with everybody else through Twitter and email and other things. Uh, and, you know, now I can, now I can, you know, uh, you know, doze off and pay attention to other people rather than pay attention to you. Sure. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's okay. I won't take that personally, Jeff. I know you could actually give this presentation in your sleep. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is there are things that we don't understand sometimes. If I was trying to develop a product that competes with the iPhone, and all I listened to is what Jeff just said, I, I could do something like that, right? I can actually do everything that Jeff said on my Palm Trio. But the one thing that the Palm Trio is not, sexy. it's not sexy, it's not fun, it's not exciting to play with, um, it's very, very practical, and I love it. I, I have a hard time living without it. And there are times when I will tell you that I would never move to an iPhone, and I think Jason has heard me say that several times. Um, in fact, I am really getting a Palm Pre after uh, the conference. But you can't just go with what they see as negative about what you're trying to find. So ask them what they like about the product, or ask them what they like about a competitor's product. Okay? Simply giving your client a shovel to dig a hole is not enough. Is there a hole, is, is their goal really just to dig a hole? How many of you have dug holes in your backyard or in your parents' backyard or, okay. How many of you did it just to dig the hole? No one? Okay. Okay, when I was five, I dug a hole in my parents' backyard, really big one, but I can guarantee you it wasn't just to dig the hole. The reason I dig the hole, dug the hole is because I was trying to get to China, because that's what everybody always told me. China's on the other end of the world, right? So I'm digging the hole and I've got a purpose, and that purpose is I want to get to China. <clears throat> it's to hold a post, build a pond, or dig straight down to see the kangaroos, right? The other reason to focus on goals is goals don't change as quickly as technology does, okay? Goals don't change as quickly as technology does. There are quite a few uh, YouTube clips out there that talk about how the people in high school today are being trained on technology that will be extinct, not extinct, but out of date by the time they graduate. So four years of school and the stuff that they're being taught as brand new will be out of date by the time they graduate. Technology changes. Goals don't. Typically the goal is always going to be the same. This means that the more information I can get about the goal means the research that I'm doing will r remain relevant longer. This is the part where, you know, I always get a... Andrew, I'm, I'm going to pick on you a bit because I know that you uh, don't, that you think, <laughs> that you think design is, is the big upfront design. How do you talk to users? When you go talk to users, because you're supposed to do that, right? With Agile. Ostensibly. Ostensibly. Okay. How do you do that? Well, I don't get on site very often. Mm -hmm. So usually it's a phone call. Okay, so you're not able to make it on site, and that's unfortunately a harsh reality in the world today. A lot of us are having budget restraints where we're not able to get out to the customer site. So you give them a phone call, and you talk to them on the phone. Uh, what we try to do is have kind of a regular uh, checkpoint, RP sort of thing, where you're talking. We don't, we don't have tons of customers, but our customers tend to have um, they're kind of large installations of what we do. And so you talk to them, say, you know, what do you like, what don't you like, and kind of give a dialogue. And basically, like, you don't get the benefits of the stuff you're talking about where you get to see what they do all the time. Sure, sure. 
And I can tell you, you can make personas without that benefit. It's just one of the things that helps. But, so you're, you're talking to the customers on a regular basis. How much time does that take? Um, maybe a full day, once a month. Okay. okay. What do you do with the data once you've captured that information? Well, I think uh, some of it is intuitively processed, like the, the last talk was, was discussing, and then uh, we try to we try to break it down. It's not a very systematic analysis, but it's, it's more getting a sense of, of what people are doing, what their pain points are, and then, and then correlating that with what our, what our strategic uh, functionality is. And, and eventually, hopefully, that narrative ends up in the user stories, right? Uh, ostensibly, okay. The, the, the goal is to get that information to the user stories. The fact of the matter is, is the research that you're doing for personas is not really that much different than you're already doing for your current project. You're going out, you're talking to customers, you're spending time, and you're capturing that data in a way that you can access it again. And it's exactly the same thing with, with, with personas. There's no reason that I have to have a big four month project before my regular project that is just about capturing the information for personas. I can do it just in time. And the great thing, as I mentioned, is if I do that research, I can actually come back to that research, not for this project, not just for the next project, but usually for three or four projects, I can use that same information that I gathered in those phone calls. So the nice thing is, is it really is just in time. I can use the information when I want it and access it because I've got it stored as personas. There was a question in the back there. Yeah, well, I was just going to mention that um you, you talked about how it's not always feasible to go outside the customer world. In today's world, a lot of our customers are all over the world, right? So um, it's not only infeasible, it's also not green, it's not very practical environmentally. You know? So while I think it's important to be on the site when you can, in certain special case studies, I think also, you know, just being productive is important. Just uh, not going not going on a day long trip when you could do a quick call to verify something. That will work, and I, I'm going to tell you, I'm one of those people, I'm not a purist, although I know several people that are, that will say, you know what, that's not enough. You gotta do more. Find someone locally. Uh, and, and there are times when you can do that. I am of the feeling that any interaction that you have with your user, any interaction that you have with your user is gonna go into the plus column for your application, okay? Is it the argument to, you know, that there's an environmental problem with traveling, you know, wherever, all over the world, is the, yeah, I can make the same argument for co-location. Like, well, you know, uh, we want to have everybody in one room, but, you know, it's not if it's going to be a much of the problem, so we're also going to stay you know, all over the world. So, I mean, I feel like we can make the same argument in, in both of them, but as we know, there's incredible value in having everybody in the same room. In the same way, there's an incredible value of actually going to the actual physical location. Say, I'm not saying you should never do that, I'm just saying that it's often impractical. Or right, and so this is where we start getting into the black and white scenario, and that, that's when I'm saying, listen, if you can never do what you have, am I gonna throw away the value that he might get by a phone call? No, I'm not. Are you ever gonna be able to get the full value if you're not actually on site? No, you're not, but some value is better than, than not, right? It, it, it is not black and white, and so you do wanna kind of balance the needs. It may be that your product is so new that you actually do need to be there right on site. That you absolutely need the, the value from seeing the worker in, in their environment. Or it may be that all you need to do is say, listen, you're on my product council. I've talked to you, you know, five times. What are the, the latest things that, are, that, that make you excited about using our product? What are the latest things that cause problems with our product? Capture the research where the user or client works, it is invaluable in learning things that they cannot or will not communicate to you. That's the one thing that I do want to point out to you. When you're just doing the phone call, you may not get all the information because there are things that they just can't, that they don't understand on how to communicate to you. Do I have enough? How do I tell when I have enough for a persona? <clears throat> it's good to have detailed descriptions because it provides a narrative, right? That's, that's why we have story cards. How do you know when a story card is enough? It's kind of hard to tell until you actually start doing them. And so this is one of those things I'm gonna challenge you to do, is go out and start creating personas. And maybe they're not gonna be very good at the beginning. Maybe they're not gonna have enough information. Does that mean five minutes left? Okay. 
Um, but the point is, is to gather the information in a narrative and to try and capture the essence of what they're trying to accomplish, what their goal is. Once you have a detailed description down, once you have a narrative of what that person does during the day, you can use quick reference tools. Fit it on the back of the story card, right? If I have a story card that says, I need a user, uh, what was the story card that you had? As a user, I want a big monitor, I want to change the number of right. Okay, as a user, I, want, I have a big monitor, I want to be able to show, show more lines on my, on my monitor so that I can get more done. Flip that card over and on the back and put an example of that user on the back. You know, uh, if this was, you know, the Russian guy, for example, you know, you could put Vladimir so-and-so, what his goals are. His goals are to get the work done as quickly as possible. That means having a bigger workspace. That means any number of other things. But just capture it in a quick reference tool and putting it on the back of the story card for which that story is written for. You know, there's a user for that story. Just put it on the back. It's a great reference tool. But seriously, just ca capture the basics, put it in a narrative form, and then add as necessary. What do I want to avoid? If the persona is not done correctly, it will be ridiculed. I can guarantee you. Even if it is done correctly, it will be ridiculed. Um, so don't be afraid of a little ridicule. <clears throat> Over elaborate personas don't get your message across any better. Okay? Um, the story that I told earlier about the guy with the cup of coffee. It's great that I can add the cup of coffee to the persona because it does tell an important part of the story. He's not able to sit in front of his monitor long enough to finish his cup of coffee. Does it matter if the, cop, the cup of coffee was an espresso? No, it doesn't. It makes no difference in the world. So don't be overly elaborate. Don't build a persona to justify a feature that you already have, okay? That's not what the personas are there for. The personas are there to help you develop features that you need. It lessens the credibility of the persona and it just doesn't ring true, okay? Unless you have a user that really does need that feature, uh, and then just build it around that user, not around the feature. How do I know when I'm successful? Well, first of all, your customers are gonna be really happy and you're gonna be making money and you're gonna just be rolling in the dough, because that happens all the time, right? Okay, maybe not quite, but you get an understanding from the developers that you're working with for, you, for your product owners, right? One of the best examples that I can tell you of success that I've had was when I was working at Landesk. And um, it was an interesting scenario. We had set up posters. We'd gone out, done our interviews, brought back the information, made posters, put them up all around <clears throat> the company. And there was a lot of ridicule. Uh, people would come by, draw mustaches on our people. Um, they'd cut out heads and put different heads on the person every day. They'd modify the name of the, of the, of the persona. And so it, it will be ridiculed, right? That's the point that I already made. But then we brought in customers that actually matched that persona. We brought in customers that were server managers and sat them down in front of our developers and let the developers ask the questions. And when they sat there and talked to the developers, the developers started getting this light going off over their head. And it was very interesting because we actually had this lady come in our persona was a male, but this lady came in, and at the end of the, of the presentation that she gave, a developer turned to me and said, that's Tim Jones. No, that's not Tim Jones. That happened to be the name of our persona, but that's how influential the personas can be. It can override what you're actually seeing and, and let you understand in a real way what that person's really trying to accomplish. <clears throat> and again, they started fighting for the, the persona in their, in their meetings. You know, you'd go to daily stand-up and that would be something they would bring up. Hey, wait a minute, We're, we forgot about Tim Jones. Tim Jones wants to go home. He doesn't want to be here anymore. Okay, resources you can use. The Inmates Are Running the Asylum, excellent book. And I promise it was on the top of my list before I knew you were coming. Um, it is probably one of my favorite reads and it just really makes it crystal clear why it's important to have personas. Also about Phase 3.0 by Alan Cooper. The persona life cycle, keeping people in mind through our product design. Uh, it has some very interesting charts on how to build up a persona. Um, 
they seem to be really good about helping you develop things to take around little quick reference charts. The user is always right, a practical guide to creating and user, using personas for the web. Sometimes we don't always have the opportunity to go out and do user analysis on site, and so this particular book talks about ways you can do surveys and how you can talk to a lot of people, um, as well as uh, how you can conduct some interviews. And then rapid contextual design, a how-to guide uh, to key techniques for user-centered design is also excellent. I would highly recommend any of these for you to read at any point in time. <clears throat> Here is just a sample. It's, it's a, this would be a quick reference card, right? Because there's no detailed description here. But the thing that is most important there is that you see John's goals right there. They're immediately in front of you. And that's what all of you need to <coughs> keep in mind when you're looking and developing software for your persona. That's all I have for today. I think we're running out of time. I think lunch is supposed to be rolling in. Uh, do we have any quick questions before we roll to lunch? Okay, I'm assuming that's because the stomachs are growling that we don't have any questions, right? Okay, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>